Yes, we haven't talked about black hair, but we're about to. Uh, he's an authority on cultural appropriation, specifically in the context of black women's hair. I want to welcome to the show Dr. Lester Neal. He's a professor at Arizona State University where he specializes in African-American cultural studies. And he's also the founder of Project Humanities. Good morning, Professor Neal. Good morning, and thank you for having me this morning. Oh, the conversation you just had. I know. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun, but I had to get over to this black hair because you can't talk about cultural appropriation without talking about hair. I was so yes. fascinated when I read that your whole enlightenment around black hair started with your daughter. Uh, oh, absolutely. Daughter? absolutely. Well, actually, start, well, actually, it started before that. Well, the enlightenment, yes. Our daughter is biracial and her mother's Italian uh, and Argentine, and I'm not. And the curiosity was, what is her hair going to be like? And that has followed and persisted uh, and left me into a sort of a scholarly space where I could look at this and sort of determine what exactly is going on that we're still having these conversations about good and bad hair. And of course, you know, the most recent uh, hair story uh, was the black woman and the gorilla hair glue. And it was a way of putting that in a context of how black women in particular have continually been struggling with this notion of hair ideals that are mostly European and Western. Yeah, I, I know you have your own hair story. I read when you started. Everybody has a hair story. Box, yes. Yes. People thought uh, you were a rapper. Started asking you yeah. why you were a rapper. And an athlete and a football player uh, and a musician and anything except a professor. Or if I'm a professor, I can't be a business professor. I must be a humanities or an arts uh, professor. African studies professor. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I assume when you just had your hair, your natural hair, before you started dreading your hair, you didn't get those questions. Nobody thought you were a no. rapper or a musician nope. or a football nope. player. Nope, not at all. And and now I have a a, uh, a community friend. Uh, our joke is that we're twins because people confuse us because he has locks, I have locks, we're both African-American, we both wear glasses, but nobody really looks at us in detail to distinguish us. So now we just go along with it and just answer as though we are the other person. Okay, uh, Professor Neal, you can't have a conversation about cultural appropriation without talking about hair. And yes. About hair, the Kardashians. Uh, yes. Obviously the Kardashians and the Jenners have yes. made a, a lot of national headlines about how they've worn their hair. Look at yes. this. Trick yes. Kardashian. Oh, not just the Kardashians, though. We've got, we've got well, uh, a lot of the them. other We're folks. We're going to talk about some others first, but we have yes. Kim, and then we have the picture of Kylie Jenner, who yes. was also criticized <laughs> for her porn role. Now, and she also wore, I guess, a do-rag to, to fashion week. And, and some gold teeth. One of them also had, uh, had a grill, yeah. yes. A, a grill. So help mm -hmm. us understand, one, this obsession by white women with cornrows or, or hairstyles that are traditionally thought to be, uh, you know, uh, the province of African-American and African mm -hmm. women. Well, there, there, there's a power in the creativity of that. And I think that those who, who want the look and the aesthetic don't necessarily want the experience. We also have to look at this through the context of white privilege and the fact that they are not black and they will benefit from this in ways that black women will not. And we have story after story after story that have, that have led to the Crown Act that we have to actually have something that says you can't discriminate against folks based on their hair types and textures. So that in and of itself suggests they can put that hairstyle on and off as they see fit, as though it's a costume, as your first guest said. This is costume for this. It's cute. It's cool. And it gets attention in the same way that Bo Derek got attention back in the movie 10. And people thought it was a new hairstyle. And it wasn't. Black women had been sporting cornrows and dreadlocks for years and not getting benefit and credit for yeah. it. Bo Derek, I think, is one of the, uh, uh, yes, there's Bo in, in that yep. movie 10 back. I think and it was, was like, look at the hairstyle. Isn't that cool? Yeah, isn't and it, cool? it was not. And it was not. Uh, 1979. So we've been having this conversation for a long time. You mentioned the Crown Act. So here in California, uh, one of yep. our, she's a supervisor, county supervisor now, but she was a state senator. Holly Mitchell uh, was responsible for, uh, you know, pushing that Crown Act through the California state legislature. And she actually wears dreadlocks herself. And it's interesting that you mentioned that we had to have a law. Yes. Senate discriminate a law. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, well, remember, it's uh, happening uh, in the military also, though. It's happening in the military. It's happening in... We had uh, to have this law that allowed allowed Black yes. women to wear cornrows, to wear natural hairstyles, whether it's an Afro or 
twist or Bantu right. knots or, or whatever and, and not be discriminated against. Right. Yet white women, as you said, you know, don the, the costume of right. those black hairstyles uh, and they and then it's fashionable. It's cool. It's cute. You know, well, that, uh, that's that's. Edgy. That's where the performative part comes in. The performative part is you put it on as a costume and then you take it off. But as you pointed out in the earlier segment, you can't take off black skin. You can't take off black experience. What you can do is dabble in and out. And yes, in fact, you know, black people are not that excited about cornrows and dreadlocks because there's a way in which we may have internalized these ideals about straightness. But well, what I do well, let me say this: we, we love them as a style, as a black woman. I can tell you, my daughters, you know, we I braided their hair from day one. Right. But what we were told is, it, whether it was private school or public school, or for me yes. as a lawyer as you become a professional, that those styles aren't professional. Yes. And so yes. you were discouraged, whether it was, you know, a, a forbidden, you know, whether it was forbidden via a policy. And we know right. that a lot of schools and workplaces right. had actual policies. Right. Or it was the friend pulling you aside saying, mm, you may not want to wear those braids on that new job. <laughs> or you may not right. want to wear that hairstyle right. on that interview. I can tell you, right. I, I have this vivid memory. I was uh, I'm from St. Louis. I had was away at college, University of Chicago. I'd gone home for the summer uh, to work a summer job. And I had colored my hair red. Mm -hmm. First time, super excited, you know, young college kid experimenting <laughs> with what you do with your hair. And I had someone say to me, you know, that hairstyle is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And you know how many white, red-headed women there are in the world? I mean, yeah, you know how many yeah the same thing. The same thing is... Hair, but yet somehow this young black girl mm -hmm. who dyes her hair red, that was inappropriate. I was in, working at a bank. So it was, you know, considered super conservative dress, you know, was the attire. But red hair on a black woman was somehow inappropriate. But if you were mm. a natural redhead as a white woman, mm -hmm. that was somehow completely acceptable. See, this is why I think we have to have some historical context for these conversations, because, you know, in the context of, of appropriation, that notion of straightening of, of hair was a reality for those who were enslaved because they they felt that they weren't as attractive as those white people they were taking care of. And so there were these these methods that were used to straighten because it, it, it left them some sort of dignity, I suppose. But, but the reality is that that persisted there. And then we started to create these products that told little black girls that they had to have straight hair in order to be pretty. In fact, there's an Essence uh, magazine ad from years ago that says something about mommy gives me P, P and J relaxer because she loves me. And then the thing goes on to talk about long and silky. What I want to stress, however, in this conversation is we are not saying that hair equals identity. What we're saying are there are ways in which there are cultural uh, signifiers that suggest that some folks can do it, i.e. white people, and get away with it, and black and brown people can't. Uh, hair is not something that you go on your cruise and you decide you're going to stop and get some cornrows and part of it. You know, I, we, you saw the meme of Ted Cruz when he headed out from Texas, <laughs> was going to, you know, do a little vacation. And, and that became part of the reality is that people are appropriating and stealing and not benefiting. Yeah. And the pressure, too. So, you, you know, in this hair context, again, growing up with what you, you mentioned with your daughter, the conversation was around good hair versus bad yes. hair. And in the black community, you know, good hair was if it was soft and if it was wavy. And if it was long, and so if it, bad hair, if it was kinky, you know, uh, if it was short, if it, right. you know, uh, you know, needed didn't blow in the wind. Yes, if it did, if it wasn't flowing, you know, <laughs> and, you know that was the thing. So when you would go right. to school as a kid, you know, white girls were constantly, you know, right, right, right. But we hair from left now. This this is not my hair, so I get right. to see it like this. So. Right. But, <laughs> but we still we still see that in 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 commercials though, and even you know uh, the queen bee. I mean, part of the the diva fans is that your hair has to blow. And it yeah. has to somehow move in the wind. So there are ways in which we are still holding on to some of those ideals that if it has to be, you know, uh, in an Afrocentric style, it has to be long so it can flow and not need a hurricane to blow it around. So, well, there, again, what I said about the pressure, I remember as a kid sitting in the kitchen, because that's where this typically, right. hair, <laughs> you know, this whole hair protocol happened in most yes. black homes. Yes, so straightening parties. In the kitchen with a hot comb on the stove with the jar of grease 
and you getting smacked in the head if you moved yes. or burned on your yes. ear and your neck. And it was a grueling process. I mean, quite frankly, it yes. was traumatizing it to be us traumatizing. Young girls yes. Yes. <laughs> to be yeah. sitting there for two hours and, you know, this this heat comb, this hot comb applied to your hair. And, you know, there was this obsession with it being so straight. And then what it did was you couldn't go out and play because yep. you would sweat it out. You couldn't go <laughs> swimming because you would, you know, sweat, you know, the water would poof it back up. So we went through all of this stuff. And horrors if it should rain. Oh, my God. You'd get wet. You would but, melt but, like sugar. But remember, remember also, this wasn't just about women, though, because I'm remembering I went through one of those Billy D. Williams phases myself. And I do remember well the Malcolm X scene where he leaves the lie on so long because the longer you leave it on, the more it burns, the straighter it becomes. Then he had to get to a toilet to rinse that stuff out. So, you know, the whole Elvis Presley conversation is really about hair as well. So and I see lots of non-Black folks with locks. And I'm certainly not going to make a decision, but I look at the pattern of the ways in which people appropriate that as a costume that you can just put on and off. Yeah. And you know what, what we hear a lot of folks saying, uh, Dr. Neal is it's just hair. Right. Like why the big debate? Why all the angst, you know, why the frustration, why the, you know, the, the, the irritation around how I wear my hair, help us understand well, how naive and, you know, uh, you know well, nothing, no, no, that statement is. Nothing is just anything. Everything is something. Mm -hmm. The question is whether or not we want to expend the critical energy to examine the whys and the what of. But hair has always been a thing. Ask those who have suffered from cancer and have hair loss. Ask those, those in particular women or men who lose their hair. Uh, look at, look at the, the, the multi-million dollar industry that hair straightening is. Uh, Chris Rock told us about that in Good Hair. Uh, look at the ways in which we have pediatric wigs for little girls, but we don't have any kind of wigs for little boys. So hair is always more than hair. It's not just the stuff growing out of your head or not. I mean, if you have alopecia, then you don't have hair that's growing regularly. So there are ways in which hair is never just. Hair is all of that. You heard the, the panelists in the top of the show, the first half of the show, talk about uh, what to do if you choose to or desire to you know, wear the, the garb of a particular culture, how you mm -hmm. then need to invest in that culture. When it mm -hmm. comes to hair, so if you are a white person and, and you are just, again, obsessed with the, the texture and the styling of cornrows, you know, you, you saw Bo Derek, you saw Adele with her Bantu knots. Yes, we did. You, you want to just, you know, you, you want to you want to do something like that because you're going to Coachella and you want to be the hippest thing at Coachella. What's the appropriate way, if there is one? for right. a white person to do that and not be accused of cultural appropriation. Well, don't do it. Okay. <laughs> That's you don't do it. You can't be accused of it. Okay. Well, and I'd add also, you know, when you're, you're, and this is connected to the hair is you'll recall from Lorraine Hansberry's uh, 1959 play, A Raisin in the Sun, where Benita talks to one of her suitors, who's Asega, the African, and the African, he is, he is from Africa. Right. Uh, and, and, and he's, she's asking him, tell me about Africa, tell me about Africa. So she has a little session about it, gets a little bit of history. And the next thing you know, she comes out in a dashiki and has cut her hair into an Afro. Lorraine Hansberry Hansberry is showing us how shallow our understanding of Africa can be also. So yes, in fact, we can appropriate and dress up on a certain day as though we're going to a, a party. And I'm not talking about dressing up going to the premiere of Wakanda. So I would say if you've got any question about it, don't do it mm -hmm. and have some friends who can check you on that. When you think you want to walk out of the door with that, and I'm not saying one friend, because one may go along with it, but have two or three friends, and that should challenge us to move outside of our circle of comfort with those who think like us, look like us, and have the same values. So that's the challenge there. That's the challenge. Great answer. I just want to ask you before I let you go about little girls, because so much of what we think about our, our ourselves, our image, our worth gets developed, you know, as kids. It's the yes. images that we see in the, the books that we read in school. It's the little girl that sits next to us that has the long yes. hair. 
You know, yep. when we go home and ask our mommy, how come our hair isn't blonde? Right. How come it's not straight? How yep. do we get African-American girls, you know, young girls to appreciate whatever their hair texture is uh, and, and not associate having long, straight blonde hair with, you know, mm -hmm. American standards of beauty? Because, I, you know, I, I, the girls think I'm not beautiful because I have thick hair, I have, you know, kinky right. hair, or I have, you know, dark hair, it's not blonde, it's not straight. How do we change those perceptions you know, that I, people I, start to form at a young age? And, and in order to change those perceptions, the adults have to change those perceptions and stop uh, uh, presenting those as ideals. And it also can't just be about the little girls, because it also has to be about the little boys who think about these ideals in those relationships. So there are ways in which fathers still tell little girls that they need to be a certain kind of way. I think what we can do as parents is the best that we can in terms of trying to, first of all, self-reflect and examine our own relationship to these ideals. Because if mom's got her hair straightened and, and is expecting to take you because your hair is like hers, then there's a way in which this becomes intergenerational. So the adults have to self-reflect before we can try to do anything in terms of modeling and it's self-esteem. And it's not just about the hair, it's about the body types. Uh, you know, are you too thin? Are you too fat? Are you too this? Are you too that? I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which we all use a dose of healthy uh, body positivity and we model what we value. Thank you for bringing up the guys because black men are can be a, as rough on black women a, as anybody can be uh, and pressure on black women growing up when you're dating, you know, about your hair, you know, yep. and, and their preference yep. Oftentimes, yeah. they've developed this preference for Black women around, you know, the texture and the length of her hair. So well, and cool. and that's also in the play in A Raisin the Sun, where jo George Murchison, who is the other suitor, comes in and says, what did you do to your hair? What's wrong with you? We're not going out to move with you looking like that. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of ways. And I'm, I'm thinking now of, of Black women who cut their hair uh, as, as a kind of movement and a, and a statement and watching the men respond to that as though women can't own their bodies, you yeah, know, which becomes part of a larger they're conversation. They're worthy if they have short hair or yes. natural hair. Yes. Yeah, we, we got a lot of work to do, but thankfully, uh, scholars like you, dads like you, uh, are making this conversation, you know, uh, uh, prioritizing this conversation and elevating it in a way that's forcing us all to kind of rethink, like you said, what we do as parents, what we do as adults, uh, what we do as professionals, what we do as, you know, influencers, you know, what what's our relationship with him? Absolutely. And gotta, absolutely. Gotta, and, gotta, and, 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 you know, bump up with, to our own unconscious biases. And that's the hardest thing, because we may be modeling things and attitudes that we're not even aware that we're doing. So have some folk, people check us. And thankfully, I have an adult daughter who checks me when I'm moving in a direction that seems uh, not in my best interest intellectually. Okay. Kudos to your daughter. Absolutely. Uh, she daughters are four. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neil, for joining us. Great work you're doing uh, at Arizona State University. Keep having these conversations. Uh, keep teaching your students with those amazing artifacts. We didn't get to talk about them, but we can see. Yes, that. we can do that another day. Yes, Absolutely. yes, yes. But thank you thank so you. much uh, for joining and us. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm a fan. I've always, when I see you on CNN, I'm just cheering because now I know you and I feel like you're a friend in my head. Well, you are a friend and we'll definitely have you back. Appreciate it. Thank you, you so much for having the conversation. Okay, great. great. I want to thank all of my guests this morning. This has been a fun morning. I didn't know where we would go with this conversation because sometimes it can get a little, you know, uh, touchy. Uh, people get sensitive when you start talking about uh, uh, cultural appropriation versus appreciation. But I think uh, hopefully everyone learned something from our guests. Uh, they had some enlightening comments, uh, just some words to live by before I get out. Some things are plain wrong. Here are five reasons cultural appropriation is wrong. One, it trivializes violent historical oppression. Two, it lets people show love for the culture but remain prejudiced against its people. Three, it makes things cool for white people but too ethnic for people of color. Four, it lets privileged people profit from oppressed people's labor. And five, it perpetuates racist stereotypes. Bottom line, be thoughtful about using things from other cultures. Consider the context and remember, as Dr. Neil just said, it's not just hair, it's culture. So put some respect on it. 
I'm out, y'all. Be safe out there. Wear your mask. And remember, we are all in this together.